Hey guys, and welcome to another session of uh, Hangouts, um, Hangouts on Air, uh, Hackathons on Air. Um, if you're expecting Lucas with me, um, he took on another role. So we have a fantastic replacement, and that's Dennis. Hi, everybody. So um, it's us two that's going to be um, talking about more, uh, you know, improvements for for the mobile uh, web in the in the next months. And today, what we thought is um, <clears throat> we're doing a little deep dive on. Um, E-commerce sites, I mean, everyone knows it's the holiday season is coming up. Um, you want to be ready for the holiday season. Um, and at the same time, e-commerce sites are quite tricky to optimize because you have a lot of things going on there. You have a lot of uh, you know, maybe JavaScript files. You might have slideshows. Uh, you have pictures. Um, yet at the same time, product pages and e-commerce pages in general are very important because you know, ideally, you want to convince your users to um, buy the items you offer. So, so we thought we do a little session on the benchmarks, as in what you want to achieve. Um, and then to make it a little bit special this time, we're going to um, present some practical examples. So we you know, dig a little bit into the code and show like how does things work, and how can you actually make a, a real impact on the performance of your site with just a few little tricks. Um, so it's it's nothing uh, you know too complicated. It's easy to follow, and of course you can uh, replay that video as many times as you want, um, or chat with us, uh, follow us on Twitter, um, and yeah, we're happy to help. So yeah, I mean as I said, uh, my name is Dominic. Some of you probably know me. This is Dennis, um, and we're both mobile UX managers um, at Google. We're based in Dublin, and uh, we have other team members that are based in Mountain View. Um, and, and this is really our daily bread. So like we, we literally look you know, at the mobile web each and every day and, and, and try to come up with improvements. So um, I think uh, that's it from my side for now. So I will hand it over to Dennis, and he will uh, discuss a few benchmarks with you and just you know, show you what's going on like, globally in the e-commerce world. Cool. Thank you very much, Dom. Um, yeah, as Dom said, we're starting off with um, a few benchmarks and case studies um, since you guys gave us that feedback that you would be more interested in benchmarks, um, and also some thresholds, like where I can optimize towards to. Um, so let's just jump right into that and see um, what kind of benchmarks we brought for you. Um, and of course, we brought some for Christmas. Um, so this is our very first um, stat you might want to take with a pinch of salt. Um, but I think you might have had an idea that it looks like this, because it's Usually, it's that moment when you walk into a store in a supermarket in September, in September, and you wonder why there is all this gingerbread, why is this Christmas decoration already here? So this is practically the stat that um, offline purchasers, um, retailers have known for a long time. Um, so actually, starting like the purchases or like the first ideas of purchases start in September. Um, and we can also see, um, and I put the source for you um, there as well, people start actually buying Christmas presents in October already. So um, this is actually the perfect time to start optimizing your site or keep on optimizing your site if you already started. Because people will start um, shopping for Christmas presents or any other holiday presents soon enough. Um, and this is where you want to be there for them were a really nice user experience um, in terms of speed and of course in terms of like um, search in terms of um, pages and navigation um, and yeah so that's the perfect time now so let's have a look at other implications um, speed in particular has on your mobile user experience because that's what we usually focus on in this um, series and of course we all. We'll also focus on it mainly today. Um, so I guess you have seen the stats before. Just to well, rem remind you again, um, speed is critical for user experience. Why is that? Because we will lose 53% of customers if our site takes over three seconds to load. To load. Um, I'd say also take this stat with a pinch of salt. Um, it might differ from vertical to vertical, um, but even if we only lose 30% of our customers, um, it's still way too many customers and visitors to lose um, at this critical first step in the, in the user journey. And all those stats kind of relate to measuring speed on 3G, right? Yeah, that's true. So when we're talking about speed, usually we recommend to um, optimize towards 3G, which has 
quite an implication of how fast your site will be. Um, so please also keep that in mind. Um, and usually, we are optimizing towards new users. Um, because as you can see on the very right side there, it is especially <coughs> crucial for new users. Because one in five users, or one out of five users, won't return to your website if the experience for her or him was bad. Um, so this is where we usually say we're trying to optimize the upper funnel, um, getting new people in or on your site and getting them engaged with your site um, is crucial, especially if you, well, paid money for these users, if you advertise your site. Um, and it's especially crucial if you're in a highly competitive environment as well, because as you can see, 29% of smartphone users will immediately switch to another site or app. So if you're in a very competitive field, which is usually the case for retail, um, it is crucial to be lightning fast because this is where you get your new users and where you get your new users to stay. Yeah, I think it's also important to, um, to think about like the word of mouth. Um, you know, if you have a great experience on a website, um, you, know, you probably tell your friends about it. You know, if your friends are like, oh, where can I buy you know, uh, shoes or a soccer ball or, or, or you know, jerseys, you, you probably recommend a site where you had a good experience. So it's not only that a dissatisfied visitor might not return to your site, but he will also not recommend your site to their friends, so like you're really losing out like in the long term. So I think that's always also quite important to keep in mind. That is true. Cool. Um, so um, just to show you some other implications, speed has, um, or to bridge the gap between user experience and your well retail business, your online revenue. Um, Speed has a very direct correlation with bounce rate. Um, so you can see that here. That's um, so us, uh, so us and Google case study we did. Um, and we could prove the direct correlation between speed and um, or loading time and uh, bounce rate. So, and as you can see, it is very significant even in the lower bracket. So we look in here 2.4 seconds to and Let's say we increase that 2.4 seconds by one second to around 3.4 seconds. The bounce rate will increase from around 13% up to 20%. And these would be very good loading times. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure what you're seeing, Dom, but I, I'd say like around these times, it is, it is very fast sites, actually. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you, you spoke about it earlier that uh, you lose about 50% of your visitors in the first three seconds. So like, you know, kind of like the three-second benchmark is is sort of like the goal we should all aim for. So, but you can see that even in those first seconds, as you said, like we we, we lose in the worst case every fifth customer or potential customer. So, um, and and if you look at the graph, it's, it's just increasing like by by each uh, you know tenth of a second. So, I, I think that graph is really good to just show the urgency um, and 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 you know should should kind of like you know, get you to to invest time and money into um, improving the mobile speed and not kind of like take it, you know, kind of like put it on the back burner and say like, yeah, I might, you know, get to that later. Yeah. I think what is crucial here as well, um, I mean, maybe you say, okay, bounce rate, but what, what I'm not really interested in bounce rate because I'm a CMO, I'm a CEO, I care about revenue. Um, I think it's a very easy argument to make because, well, as you can read here, user that bounce usually don't shop or sign up on your site. So of course, in the same study, um, we also can see that loading time directly correlates um, with online conversions, or so with your mobile conversions here. Um, and as you can see, these were only mobile conversions, so that's why the number is not super high, but that's pretty much what we see for retail sites on an average. Uh, might be higher for you, uh, or might be lower. Um, but as you can see, it's crucial. Just one second more loading time will decrease your conversion rate by 20%, from almost 2% to 1.5%. And that is quite a lot if you think in revenue, depending on your average car, it be a lot of money for you. Yeah, and I also think what, what's quite important, what, what we hear quite, quite often is that, you know, that, that e-commerce um, you know, own like website owners just accept the low conversion rate on mobile, and I don't think that has to be true, right? Yeah. Because we do see higher conversion rates, and it really correlates with the user experience. So, like, I would really recommend to not just take a low conversion rate as a given, but rather like really focus on what can I do 
to you know to increase the the conversion rate. Mobile speed is one thing, but there are other things like improving the general usability. Um, you know, how easy is it to put in credit card numbers? So like, I think that's really important as well for for the holiday season when you know a lot of people, uh, you know, like shop and a lot of people buy a lot of presents and and buy more than they would usually buy. That did you really get the checkout funnel right? And yeah. we actually have an, uh, another video on that, how to optimize the checkout funnel. So. Um, if you go to, to our website, which we will post in the comments, you can browse through the videos and um, and we discuss that topic as well because there are quite a few things you can do to to really increase the usability of, of your e-commerce site. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. So usually we say speed is our conversion, and that's why we're focusing heavily on speed in this series. Um, but as Dom just said, um, it's also important to focus on the more, I'd say, traditional UX um, Parts as checkout funnels, um, search on your site, clear CTAs. Um, so yeah, you should definitely browse through our repository and see, um, especially the one uh, on checkout funnels might be very helpful. Um, so, but to end on a positive note here, um, this also means that it's rather easy to really in increase your conversion rate as well. Because if you read it well from a in a positive mindset, it means that if you increase or if you sorry if you decrease your page loading time by one second, you can increase your conversion rate by up to twenty seven percent, which also might be a lot of money for you. Um, so um, to round this up, what we always say is. Page speed is not like a nice to have, um, and performance is not a nice to have. It's a feature. It's uh, it's money at the end. It's your online revenue, um, which you can control with rather easy optimization techniques. I'd say, Dom, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's our goal as well. Um, so w w when we host th these sessions, we're not trying to to do some rocket science here, um, you know, and, and discuss the most complicated topics that might not be achievable on your side or might take you know months to achieve. Because you know, if you have a large e-commerce site, you have a big infrastructure, so it's not just easy to to change things. So we really try to focus on the low-hanging fruit of like things that you can easily implement, um, but that have a big effect. So um, so again, like you know, some some things we discuss you. Probably like I know that, and, and that's you know definitely you, you probably do know that. I mean you know you're all great developers, and um, you know there, there's so much stuff out there to learn. So it's definitely not uh, you know the most advanced techniques, but it's really the techniques that have a big impact. And um, as as Dennis said, I mean you know with every second you potentially increase bounce rate and 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 lower conversion rate. Um, but you know it doesn't matter if you don't. The two seconds or three seconds low time. I mean, if you're at ten seconds and you even bring it down to six, you will see a difference. So um, I'd say that you know, if you don't think you can achieve three seconds, it's it's not a reason to not try. Definitely. Even if you achieve you know a four second improvement from ten to six, that's uh, that will make a big difference, and you will see it in in your stats um, and and in the end on your return on investment. That is true. So. Let's jump into the benchmarks and status quo because I think that's one of the main questions I get from my customers, and I'm guessing you too, Dom. Is like, where should we optimize towards to give us some stats? Um, we can well, we need some rough guidance. Like, yeah, it's it's always difficult, but but that's why why I think it's really cool that that you're actually discussing that. Yeah. So let's have a look. First of all, this is um, well, basically. The status quo right now. Um, so what we see, and we analyzed a lot of sites, is that um, sites take around, on an average, 22 seconds to load. This is fully load time. Um, keep that in mind, which is um, higher than other speed metrics we usually use. Um, we'll talk about another metric, a speed index, you might have heard of um, in a bit. So this is fully load time. Um, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that as a developer. Um, and it is quite high. And you can see, again, we showcased it in this graph before already. You lose out on people um, because, like, just seconds will really increase your bounce rate here. Um, so, after giving you the status quo, let's look at what a mobile site or your mobile site m sh maybe should look like. Please also keep in mind these are average numbers, and we know that usually retail sites are 
heavier than other sites because you need to show your customers what are you sell what you are selling. So you need to have high quality pictures. You usually need a lot of JavaScript because you have um, well that's stuff like A B testing, etc. on your site. So we are aware of that. Um, so keep that in mind, um, especially if you look at the page weight and the total requests. Um, but having that said, even if you have a rather heavy site with a lot of pictures um, and a lot of JavaScript and CSS maybe, there's still a lot of techniques you can use to towards the above the fold content. So basically giving the perception of a very fast site, although you're loading actually a very heavy site. Um, so it is more about prioritizing what to show first keeping your your site very um, ideally you would do that as well but some techniques later on how you could how you can prioritize um, content um, so here are the stats uh, I think the main stat here we already talked about it's speed index um, speed index is a metric um, we would recommend using as a as the only metric and um, it's always good to have a look at certain metrics I'd say but speed index basically uh, measures the perceived speed for users. Um, so it measures how long does it take in milliseconds to display the above the fold content, so the visible content for your user wants to see. Also, usually, um, we already talked about this, um, recommending a progressive display of the of the, uh, of the because the earlier can show something like a, a better the better the feeling for speed will be for the site. Um, and, and just quickly, if maybe not everyone is familiar with speed index, what tools can we use to actually uh, generate the speed index score? That's a good question, yeah. So um, we use an um, abbreviation here, WPT. It's a web page test. Um, you might know it. It's a very handy tool. It's webpagetest.org. Um, we can also link that in the comments later. Um, it's, um, it's a nice tool. and. For example, it has this speed index, um, which yeah gives you a first idea of the perceived speed. It has a lot of other nice uh, features. I think you will show some, some yeah. uh, screens later on, or like we will also jump into the tool. Yeah, I mean exactly. Like we, I also tested um, the one side we're going to discuss. I tested on the web page test because, as Dennis said, it's a great tool. It's free, uh, most of all, so you don't have to uh, pay a dime for it, um, and. I think the greatest thing is that you can actually test your site under different or in different scenarios. Yeah. So, like, you can actually say, um, you know, how does my site perform in um, in the UK or in Ireland or in Germany um, I, on a three G connection or four G connection or Wi Fi connection? So, I think it's really handy. For example, if you have a lot of international traffic and you want to say, okay, I think my site is performing well, you know, in the UK, but what happens if someone from the US visits my site? Um, how 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 is it looking then? So I think that tool is great for that, and it's free, and um, you can play around with it. And it doesn't only give you the speed index score; it gives you uh, information about what are you loading, when are you loading it, uh, what's the weight of a particular file type, like you know, what's the weight of JPEGs compared to the rest of your site. So I think it's it's a really great tool to yeah. to, to utilize. That is true. OK, let's jump into the benchmarks. This is, this is probably the second question I usually get. So how does it look like in my vertical and in my market? So we decided here to take Germany as a well benchmark market to well somehow showcase that even a mature market like Germany can stay behind its potential. Um, you can see that here. Um, so we have picked out the same three stats here. So in yellow, you see the speed index. In blue. The average request count and then read the well, heaviness of a page, the weight. Um, and you can see that retail is rather, well, bad. <laughs> There's not a way to put it in uh, most of these stats. But um, it is kind of like what you said earlier, yeah. right? That, that retail pages tend to be a little, a little bit heavier than other sites. Exactly. So that's why it's good to have like a look in your vertical as well um, and not compare yourself only to other verticals. Because let's say for a lead gen um, business, it is way easier to have a lighter site than, for example, for a retail site. You can see automotive is also rather 
slow here. That's usually because they also use a lot of pictures showcasing their cars. Maybe have a car config for configurator stuff like that. Um, so there, there's stuff on your site you will always need, um, and that's well fair game. Um, but we will show you how you can display at least well the above default content faster, as I said before. Um, so also, if you're interested in other market stats, um, I think we have these stats at least for the UK and the USA. Um, I think we have probably some views from the UK as well. Um, you might want to type uh, in this short link we put there for you. Um, this will guide you to a thing with Google side um, where you can get more um, well, benchmarks for your own market. Um, so I'll leave that up for a second. Um, but I think we will also put this in the comments later on. Yeah, and I mean, once once the, the video has finished, you can obviously go back and um, you know have a look at the slides, um, and yeah, you know, just um, get back to any slide you you, you thought was interesting um, to get some more information about. Exactly. So I think to finish this, um, we are aware, and you should be aware that um, retail is um, well in terms of speed optimization, it can be tricky because you have to have a lot of stuff on your side, um, but it is it is doable. So you can definitely go closer to that five seconds we talked before. Um, and as Tom already mentioned before, even if you go from like 10 seconds to six seconds, it's still a great improvement. And you will see that in your other business metrics. OK. Um, well, and to finish this now, before we really jump into our live coding sessions, let me show you two case studies I brought for you um, very quickly to really showcase the impact you can have if you will really optimize towards performance and speed. Um, so the first one is called Modernissa. It's um, an, a big retailer for women's clothes um, with its headquarter in Turkey, in Istanbul. Um, and they partnered with us. and conducted a usability workshop um, where we focused heavily on um, data-driven decisions. So we looked at the stats we had. We also um, came up with new ways of measuring. Um, we integrated Google Analytics 360 and Google Optimize, um, which is always a good idea. If you don't do that already, um, you might want to consider do A-B testing, um, because that is very crucial for, for retail sites, I think. Um, and their main goal was to understand the customer's um, cross-device behavior better, to, well, in general, come up with a better mobile strategy or a new mobile strategy, and to improve, well, user experience and simplify it for all their customers. Um, and they made a lot of changes, actually. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail here. But you can see the three business stats we put up there. It is really impressive. They had a 91% growth in mobile conversion rate. And they decreased their mobile site bounce rate by 9% and had a massive increase in their mobile site revenue. Um, so that basically ties to what I said before. It is not a nice to have. It is a feature. You can really turn that performance optimization into a lot of money at the end, into revenue, um, and then put that again maybe into new and nice features. Um, so this was our retail. Um, uh, well, or direct customer example, um, and I figured maybe some of you are working for agencies and tuning in today. I also wanted to give you a brief look on how you can well help your customers if you're an agency and help them improving their M site speed. So I brought that second one, uh, that second example with me. This is um, by Auto AutoParts.com, um, a US company, um, and they worked with their agency ROI Revolution. Um, and they focused a lot on making their mobile website faster and more user-friendly. Um, but they also had very, very nice stats in terms of improvement. So they improved their mobile site speed by 50%. So that is quite a lot. Um, and you could, well, pretty much instantly see that they also improved their bounce rate, which ultimately, um, well, ended up in decreasing their cost per conversion and also increasing their mobile conversion. Um, so basically, again, what we saw in the, in the stats before. Um, but I'd say now, um, after seeing the general business impact we can have, um, and we're hoping you're already hyped for our um, live coding session, so I'd say, Dom, should we just jump into the, the coding examples and techniques you brought us? Sure. So what we're going to do now is I just run through a few slides to just, you know, 
very quickly explain actually how certain um, certain elements the um, the the critical rendering path. So like the speed perception, um, and then we look at what we can do to actually optimize um, elements like uh, or you know uh, uh, like files like CSS, uh, JavaScript, images. Um, what happens if I have a dependency? Um, for example, a slideshow in the critical rendering path. How does it impact uh, the, the speed of my site? What can I do to, you know, maybe move some of the stuff that I don't need further down the line and don't load it at the very beginning? So we're looking at a few things, um, and then at the very end, I would say we have a look at the comments, maybe like at the live chat. Maybe some of you have some questions, and um, we'll we'll try to answer uh, answer a few questions if we don't run out of time. Um, if we do run out of time, we do have a lot of sessions already uh, on our website. So please feel free to um, have a look uh, and browse through the videos. But we will try to uh, we will try to do our best to um, to address all your uh, questions and concerns. Um, so the critical rendering path, um, optimizing for speed perception. Um, Dennis already touched it very briefly um, earlier when he said that it's not really that important necessarily to reduce the overall load time or the overall weight of your site, but rather do something that makes the render, like the loading, appear very quickly. Um, and that is what we call speed perception. And you know, a lot of other people call it <laughs> speed perception as well. Um, so really, what we're, what we're trying to focus on is to optimize the critical rendering path which is basically what happens in the first three, four, five seconds when someone visits visits your site. And as Dennis mentioned earlier as well, um, we're focusing on the new user. So like, it's not the returning customer that has already a cached version of your site, um, and you know, therefore it doesn't really run into those uh, issues. We're focusing on the on on the first customer, and we're focusing on the first customer that comes uh, through a three G connection because uh, our um, our approach is. If we optimize for the worst possible case, we sort of covered all cases, and I think that's what we that's what we all want. I think it's also worth mentioning at that part that we our last uh, hackathon on air, uh, we had a deep dive deep dive on how speed is perceived for a user. Um, so if you're more interested in that, um, there we're touching more psychological um, aspects of well how you perceive speed and when. How annoying does it get, and when is when it's the most annoying? Um, that might be interesting for you as well. Yeah, I think that was actually a really interesting session. It was Lucas' last session, um, and we talked about as that is actually psychology and active waiting time and passive waiting time, and how users or humans in general overestimate uh, waiting time. So let's say you, I think the passive waiting time is um, overestimated by eighteen percent. So like if you know if your site loads in five seconds, you can add another 18% because that's what actually uh, users it takes to load the site. So it's actually a really interesting session and definitely worth checking out. Um, from that session, I took one slide um, that I want to just very briefly discuss because I think it's always great to get into this, this topic. Uh, and that is the following. Um, basically, what I like to say is busy people are less impatient. Which um, which basically means you know keep keep the user occupied. So so those are three pictures um, you know from the real world. Um, on the left hand side, that is um, you know the, the traffic light button in New York. You got six and a half thousand from them uh, of them, and four and a half thousand don't work. But the city still you know just you know doesn't doesn't take them off because uh, the ped pedestrian that walks up to the traffic light and pushes this button believes that while pushing this button. Uh, you know, the traffic light switches to green much quicker, even when it doesn't. Um, and the, the middle picture is, is sort of the same idea. So you got the underground in London, and you got the button uh, to open the door and to close the door. And and I lived in London for seven years, and I know that those buttons don't work. So the, the driver is doing that anyway. But you know, you leave it there because people like to push buttons and and to think that things go quicker. I think we got the same uh, just the same phenomena. Uh, in, in elevators, when you got the, the, the button to close the door, um, and most of them don't actually, uh, you know, are, are not actually functional. Um, I think the greatest example is, is the, uh, the the picture on the right. Um, it's Houston Airport, where passengers uh, complained that it takes too long for their luggage to arrive uh, once they have, uh, the, uh, you know, exited the plane. And logistically, 
it was impossible to to speed it up. Um, you know, I guess there are a lot of processes and uh, maybe additional screening. So you know, the emperor thought, okay, we need we need, to, we need to come up with a solution to satisfy our our passengers, but we don't really have you know a way of doing it. So what they did instead is they increased uh, the, the 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 time it takes from the gate to the uh, you know to the um, to the luggage area, uh, increase it by six. So when the you know when the passenger arrived there, it took him it took him or her six times longer. But the luggage was already there, and suddenly the feedback was, "Oh wow, it's great at Houston Airport. The luggage is always there when I when I you know when I arrive." So so I think this is the idea of like you don't actually win any time, but you keep the passenger the user occupied, and while the user is occupied. It doesn't feel like they're waiting, um, and I think that is exactly what we want to achieve. So we pretty much want to turn passive waiting time into active waiting time, and that lets us uh, dive into um, the critical rendering path and looking at how is it actually affected. So as I said, I'll run through the slides and then we go over to the code and and you know have a look what we can do. So this is basically. What happens if someone visits your site? So you know, a browser like a, cl a client requests your your page, like let's say your product page, and um, you know it it's, it's gets sent uh, sent to the server, and the server returns the HTML, and in, inside the HTML, the browser you know detects uh, like other files that are required in order to render the page and, and you know, put it on the screen. So basically, you get the HTML. You build the document object model, but now the browser, uh, you know, hits CSS and JavaScript, and now what happens is basically that everything is blocked. So the browser doesn't do anything at that point anymore until uh, it has received the CSS and the JavaScript, like the full response, and built the CSS object model. The reason simply is that the browser says, "Well, I don't really know how I should display the content." So I'd rather wait until I have everything, and and once I'm sure how to display it, then I build the CSS object model, then I run the JavaScript, then I build the, the the complete document object model, and then I render the page. So that is you know the the, the typical way of how it works, and and usually that's no issue um, because you know we do need CSS and we do need, need JavaScript. So you know we're not saying get rid of all of it. Um, you know that would look rather ugly, but what we're saying is you got to be Aware of the fact that it does block um, the parsing and therefore it blocks the rendering. So, and our you know what, what we try to achieve is we want to get rid of this block as much as possible. And what you can do is you can work with um, asynchronous loading of resources. So most of you probably have heard of you know adding async to a you know to a script tag you know, to a JavaScript tag. Um, that's pretty common for you know, uh, tracking scripts or pixels, um, but you know you can also do that to to any other JavaScript file. And so while back in the day, not not back in the days, but a lot of optimization techniques they focus on putting the JavaScript maybe like at the very bottom of the page. And and I think that's that's a great start. But you run into an issue, which we'll see later, is that you know if you optimize that way. You put the JavaScript at the very bottom, and then you start rendering the page. But then, in the critical, you know, in 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 the buff default content, you actually require the JavaScript that you put at the bottom because maybe you need it for a slideshow. So you're you're not really optimizing it because you still need it, and you still need to wait until the browser has part, parsed the full document and you know executed the script in order to display the content. So async and defer um, are great ways for JavaScript. Um, to to handle that, and I, I have a slide later uh, that tackles that. Um, and another great thing is, which maybe not every one of you have heard of, is uh, you know loading CSS non-render blocking because that is also possible. And the idea is pretty much the same. So you know if you think about it, you're having a page and um, you have a lot of CSS, obviously. You know a lot of CSS for the product page, for the home page, for the checkout page, and in most cases, you don't require all of the CSS at the very beginning. So the idea here is to say, well, hold on a second. If I don't really need all of that, why do I load it and delay the, you know, delay the rendering for the user? Why don't I just load what I actually need? 
and load the rest asynchronously. So I do load it. I do put it in cache. So I have it for you know um, either the below the full content or for the next page. Um, but I don't actually um, delay the, the rendering initially. So this is what what we want to do, and what you know where where we're going to show you some you know some coding examples of how to load CSS asynchronously and what to do with JavaScript and how to get rid of JavaScript, how to maybe replace it with pure CSS. Because you know, many times you use JavaScript because there are some handy plugins um, that make things easy. But actually, with a few lines of CSS, you could achieve the same thing. And, uh, and we're having a look at that later as well. So as you can see here, um, in, in this example, the CSS and the JavaScript is completely loaded asynchronously. So the difference is that you built the, op op uh, built the document object model, and then you in, uh, immediately render the page, and then you build the CSS object model and, and run the JavaScript. So I mean, this is an ideal example. As I said, you definitely need some CSS and JavaScript. You don't want to you know, render basically a blank page. But you, know, you get the idea. And one way of loading CSS asynchronously is to use what, uh, what is called load CSS. So um, that's, that's a great JavaScript function. Um, there's a short link on there. You can uh, go straight to the GitHub uh, page. And, and basically, what it does is you know, it, lets you, um, it, it lets you define a non-critical CSS resource and then load that CSS resource while you actually display other stuff. Um, and I think that's really great. And while we're at it, I'm just showing you uh, quickly what, the, what I mean. So I'll just uh, uh, switch desktops. Um, so sorry for interrupting, but I think it's very interesting to just have a look at that. So, so we're here, basically. Um, and you see like that we have uh, white text on green background. And it, this is a really, really simple example. So um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's rather ugly as well. So um, don't judge me on that. But basically, the idea is um, we're, we're testing how does load CSS actually work. So here, we have this page. We added a CSS file. And we, um, we you know, put a sleep function in there to say, like, well, don't do anything for five seconds, just to you know, basically simulate a really, really, really large CSS file. Usually, what would happen is, you would not see any text before this CSS is loaded. Because as we said earlier, CSS and JavaScript is completely render blocking. But here, what you will see when I reload it, you will see that you can see black text on gray background. And then once the CSS is loaded, as in like, you know, the, we, we are past the five second mark, then suddenly it switches to white text on green background. I'll show you just quickly. Just reload it. So you see it here. It's gray background, black text. And usually, you would not see that because you're loading CSS. But you do see it because we're loading the CSS asynchronously. And now it switches to white text and green background. And the way it works is I'll show you that quickly. It's pretty simple. It's, it's pretty much copy paste. So all the work is done for you. So we're going in here, going to the testing. And I'll just quickly show you the, load, uh, the, the CSS file so you can see here the sleep function, five seconds. Um, you know, again, we're just basically simulating a large CSS file. Um, and then we have the load CSS um, function in here. So you can see that initially we say body is, uh, you know, the background is uh, you know, gray, CCC. Um, and then you know, you got the, the function, which you're just going to uh, copy and paste. Uh, you're required to, you know, to put the href in there, um, but it's optional. For example, to, um, you know, to put a value for the for the media tag, and then what you do down here, basically load your CSS file. So this CSS file would obviously not be slow CSS.php, but that would be your non-critical CSS. So all the other CSS you would load just as usual, but then you would put this function in the header. And then you would define the non-critical CSS here. And then the result, what you will get, is that you're only loading this CSS, you know, or you're loading the CSS while you're loading other stuff. And then once um, it's actually loaded, then it, it, then, then it will be applied. So this is really handy. Um, I know that CSS, it's, it's quite a tricky subject, because you know, especially if you started a long way ago, like a long time ago, it might have gotten a little bit messy, so it's hard to actually extract the critical CSS. But it's really worth it because, again, like CSS is fully render blocking, and 
if you have like a very bloated CSS file, um, it, it will have an impact on your bounce rate and your conversion rate. Cool. So back to our slides. Um, as I briefly touched earlier, um, you know what you can do with CSS, you can do with JavaScript, and vice versa. So um, the first screenshot is how JavaScript is executed or, or like handled usually. So you see the HTML parsing is going on. And then you, know, you hit the JavaScript, you stop the parsing, you download the script, you execute the script, and you continue with the parsing. And um, again, that's the problem. We're blocking the rendering and the parsing, and therefore the rendering at that point. So what you can do are, is two things. You can uh, use async or defer. Um, and there are two benefits. The async one is that you, know, you do execute the script as soon as you have it. That's why you usually use it for tracking pixels and stuff, because you don't really want to wait until you know, everything is loaded, because maybe the user has already navigated. Um, so you don't, you know, you don't want to have incorrect uh, uh, tracking results. Or you can use defer, um, which is for JavaScript files that are maybe not that critical. So you download it just as you would do with async, um, but then the execution happens after the parsing is uh, completed. Um, another reason when to use defer is that defer makes sure to keep the order of your JavaScript files. So if you have dependencies, let's say you have a, J a jQuery plugin that obviously depends on jQuery, you want to use defer rather than async, because if you use async, uh, you cannot guarantee which script will finish first. And if it's the plugin, um, then you know obviously, since the dependency is not there yet, it won't work. So um, this is really, you know, really important to, to think about like when you know using defer and async it, it, at the right moments. Um, as I said earlier, in ideally maybe don't use JavaScript at all. If you do use it um, and it's critical for your for the above default content, then don't async it because you don't really want to wait, uh, you know, any longer for it. You want it immediately. Um, so there are like a few things to consider, and we'll uh, we'll get into that um, in a little bit. Um, and then we're also having the um, like problem, not a real problem, but you know, the, the impact of, of custom fonts or web fonts on quick rendering. Um, you know, web fonts are, are beautiful and, and great, and we all love them. Um, but the prob problem is they're also quite slow, um, because a web font comes with two components. One is the CSS, and one is the actual font file. Now, when you have multiple variations, what happens is that you need multiple font files. Um, and you know what happens a lot is that you know maybe you find some nice font, uh, you know, in our Google font library, and you say like, oh yeah, I need you know, why don't why don't I load like a few variations, like 300, 400, 600, 700? I might need it somewhere, maybe not, maybe the italic versions as, as well. And then what happens is like you're loading CSS, and CSS, as we said, is render blocking initially, and then you're loading the font files, and the font files what they generate is the a flash of invisible content, which means the text is already there, but it's not seen. So um, I think on, um, and Dennis, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's on Chrome, we have a three second timeout that if the web font is not loaded, um, then we will use a fallback font uh, anyways. But I think on Safari, that timeout is much, much longer. Yeah, I so, think so, too, yeah. So there the effect is even worse. I'd say. Yeah, I think it's like something up to 20 seconds. Don't quote me on that, but it's much, much longer. Um, and I think we all agree if we don't show text for 20 seconds, it's, it's going to be an issue sooner or later. Um, so again, there are some you know, ways what you can do um, to, to avoid this. And um, some of you probably guessed it. Um, there is also a way to load web fonts asynchronously. Um, there are actually two great quick links. Um, that are very easy to follow. So I won't really touch on that too much. Um, it's Web Font Loader and it's Font Face Observer. Uh, I just quickly, you know, uh, explain you know what it actually does. So like, you know, you're 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 having a bit of JavaScript and you're defining which font you want to uh, load. So in, in this case, um, you know, you say oh, I want to load the Laura font from from you know from Google, uh, and then you have different CSS classes: WF Loading, WF Active, WF Inactive. And basically, what you do is you define what happens when. So, like, when I'm loading the font, I have I do what? I have a fallback font, and it styles my text in you know in a certain in a certain way. When I have loaded the font, then I basically the the class which might be attached to the body tag is swapped to WF Active, and there you have the uh, you know the styles for the custom font, and then you have the class Inactive, which is that you know you fail to load the font. 
So the class gets swapped to WF inactive. And there you can say, OK, if everything fails, I do that. I think it's really great because you, know, you don't have to miss out on, on web forms. Um, but you can sort of like define you know, what happens in between. What, what do I do while I'm actually loading the font? You know, I don't want to wait for it. I'll, I'll do already something while I, load it, while I load it. So those are two great ways. What I'm showing later is actually um, a way to load the font on the onload event, which is basically you're having this fallback font. And once the document is loaded, then you start loading web fonts, and you know, then, you, then you swap it out. Um, that is, you know, in, in certain situations, even better because you don't take up, uh, you know, uh, connections uh, for the font files, but you rather do that at the very end. Um, which way to go? It's it's up to you. You can play around. I definitely recommend to visit the the, the, the short links and just get a get a feel for it. Um, and I'm sure that um, what we hear quite often, what some people will now say is, oh well. But if I do that, we run into this flash of unsell content. And, and people don't like that, and designers especially. Developers often don't care. Um, and well, it's a fair point. It's not great. But um, there's, also, there's also ways to sort of like, kind of like circumvent that. And um, one of our uh, colleagues at Mountain View uh, came up with, the, with a tool called FontCell Matcher. And what FontCell Matcher does is it actually allows you to match a fallback font with the web font, and then play around a little bit with line height, font weight, letter spacing, word spacing, to make it as similar as possible so that when you actually swap out the font, you don't even notice it. Uh, well, you notice it a little bit. It's a, it's, it's, it's a flicker, um, and, but, but it's not too bad. And I think it's sort of like you know, an agreement between you know, the people that hate flash of unsell content and people that say, well, but we really need to you know, improve speed. This is a great way of saying, like, okay, let's do that, and, and we sort of like meet in the middle. Um, I might touch it later because I want to make sure that we're having enough time for the coding examples. So just bear with me uh, for that. Otherwise, visit the um, the, the short link. It's self-explanatory. Um, you know, fallback font. You can define which one you want to use. Web font. You can define which one you're using, and then you're basically just playing around. But um, if we have time, I will uh, you know give you a live example of that as well. I think that also. Just a quick note on that. I think that also ties a little bit into our uh, well recommendation that progressive um, display of content is always better than showing everything at the end, super styled. Um, that's pretty much one very good example. I think rather show um, an unstyled text than show nothing, like an invisible text. Um, totally, because yeah. the user doesn't want to wait and rather have something unstyled, I guess. Um, I, I think, of, yeah, I think that's exactly it, right? Um, I mean, we're talking about you know turning passive waiting time into uh, uh, active waiting time, and it's you know give the user something. It's better than you know having users you know stare at a blank page um, because I think it's always important to to note that you know while you might know what's going on in the background, the user doesn't. Yeah. The user just sees a blank page and says, "Okay, maybe it's broken." Yeah. Um, I think it's safe to say widescreen is probably the worst experience you can offer to your users. Probably, yeah. I mean, you know, if you don't show anything. For a long time, then you know users might think, well, you know that side is broken. That's bad experience. I just never come back. And that touches what Dennis uh, talked uh, talked about earlier. You know, one in five users, if if they have a bad experience, never return, and that's that's quite a shame. Cool. Cool. So um, I would say we go into some uh, coding examples now, and we I still have some slides on you know s saturating your bandwidth, uh, which is quite easily done on three G. So let's just have a look at uh, you know a couple of examples, and then just kind of like see uh, the results. So um, this is an example page which which sort of checks most boxes when we're talking about an e-commerce site. So take this as a very as a very ex abstract example. So <coughs> obviously you know some other e-commerce sites are way more complicated and complex, <coughs> but um, you know. I found this quite good because you have a few elements here, like you have, you know, obviously the logo. You got your message uh, on top. You got, you know, like a background image, which you might question if that's actually needed, um, you know, for your breadcrumbs. Then you have, you know, the slideshow to showcase your products, um, which probably for this type of thing is quite important. 
Um, then you have the title, you have the price, uh, some ratings, postcode check, etc. Got some more description. You got like you know this, this little ac accordion here, which is you know done with JavaScript, which is very common as well. Um, you know, so we're, I think you already know where we're getting to is like that you that that such site has a lot of things that are nice, but now we need we need to see if all of them are actually necessary. Um, you know, and just go, going further down, you got you know some. Some more like uh, you know featured arrivals, and here you have like this very cool animation. Maybe it adds to conversion, maybe it doesn't. Um, so again, you know, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty good site, and I run a test on it. Um, and usually, when a, when you run tests on something like that, um, you see something like that. So this is web page test, as we as we discussed earlier. So. What you want to do is, in, in our case, I tested it from Ireland on an emu em emulated uh, Nexus 5. The other one I did on, on an iPhone 6, just you know, I don't want to be biased. Um, and then, as we said earlier, on a 3G connection. So and what you see here is you get a, a lot of information, you know, fully load time, first byte, start render. And the one thing we want to focus on is the speed index that we discussed. So speed index of 6,300, which is measured in milliseconds. So basically, in 6.3 seconds, the you know, important content should be loaded. Is not even that bad. Um, but when we now look into the waterfall, we actually see that there are still some things that, you know, that that are not ideal. Especially if you sort of go back to what Dennis talked about earlier, how you know how it actually affects bounce rate and conversion rate, um, you know, if you delay the loading process. So let's have a look. Um, here, film strip view. Now, we see what's going on here. So this is the timeline. So it basically takes a screenshot every half a second to show you what is displaying in, you know, in, in three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, six seconds. And you can see here that we generated this nice render block, which is basically in the first five seconds, we're having this blank page. And you know, Mark Dennis words, Mark, a blank page is uh, you know, not ideal. You, you really want to reduce uh, the, the amount of time it shows a blank page. And so that happens for four and a half seconds. And then we start rendering. So then we, you know, slowly start with, you know, the logo. And then you see, like, a black, um, you know, a black um, bar here. And you see the white screen. And, and now you're thinking, why is that white? About the flash of, uh, uh, of invisible content. So. We're loading a web font. The text is already there, but we can't show it because you know we're still waiting for the web font, which is not ideal. So um, now, after six seconds, we're having the text, but we're still loading this really, you know, really, really large background image that you can barely see. Yet it, it takes multiple seconds to load, and then we're, we continue. We continue now, like at six point five seven seconds, the speed index actually believes the site is complete because it looks sort of complete. Um, but not knowing that we're actually still waiting for the for, for the slideshow. So look, we go further down the line, and then at 10 seconds, that's when you actually the product picture uh, appears. And I mean, if you think about it, you know, you try to sell shoes, and for the shoes, for the most important thing is to show the shoes. But you don't see the shoes until I have waited 10 seconds, and that is obviously um, you know very unfortunate. So let's have a look what that actually what, what that is caused by. So just a quick note on that as well. I think it also showcased very well that it's not a good idea to just focus on speed index. Right? It's a good, uh, good first metric to well, use as a first compass or whatever. But it can be tricky, right? Because as you just showed us, around 6.5 seconds, 7 seconds, speed index thinks the, well, the site is visually populated, which is kind of, it kind of is. At the end, as you mentioned, you want to sell a shoe, and there is no shoe on the side. So exactly, yeah. Um, we would probably recommend to always do that visual analysis that you just did as well to see how much of a progress you made after you implemented some stuff. Right? Definitely, yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's a really, really good point because you know, no tool is perfect. No index score is perfect. Um, so you know, if, if if you have a speed index that seems all right. Always double check if that's actually you know 
uh, the truth and or if there's something you can still uh, optimize. Um, so going back into the waterfall, you know, so what's happening here? Um, no, I just build it up a little bit like how it would usually be. So you know, you you would have the first connection um, to your site. Um, you know, I just ran it on on you know on 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 my like on a subfolder of, of of my own domain. So like, there's no SSL certificate uh, implemented on the initial request. Usually, it probably would be. Um, and then you start loading some elements, like maybe CSS, uh, like a logo. And now you can see here. Here's the first thing what happens is, um, you know, the, the browser hits the the web font and it says, okay, well, I need to I need to request that. So it starts requesting the CSS because, as I said, the web font is um, you know is based on two components, a CSS and a font file. And now I just basically grab those files from third party side, and you know. There's no judgment. The only reason I did it is because that's what we often see is that uh, very critical files are hosted on a CDN. So CDNs are great, and if you have international traffic, it's, it's very important, you know, to, to to serve the content to the user from a very close location. But don't forget that when you request a re request, um, you know, resources from CDN, you make an additional connection. So you you have to resolve the DNS. You have to do the socket connect. Um, you have to do the uh, SSL negotiation, and then you have to actually request um, request the resource. And so what happens here is you see, like you know, we have the initial connection. We start with the CSS, the logo, and now, which is very common for an e-commerce site, we're having more CSS files: Bootstrap, Flex Slider, Font Awesome, you know, responsive tabs. You know, go back here, kind of like this type of thing. You know. You're loading like an extra file for like these responsive tabs, you know, um, and then like once you're done with the CSS, you have some JavaScript because basically for this slideshow here, you need JavaScript in in the critical rendering path. So now you're going to like, um, you know, get jQuery. Um, you you know get a modernizer custom.js. You have a JavaScript file for the mini card image zoom. Which is handy on desktop, probably on on mobile. You don't really hover over and zoom. You sort of like use your fingers to pinch. So, you know, questioning is that actually necessary? Um, then you have the JavaScript file for the responsive tabs that I just showed you. So, for this for, for this very small uh, element of like having three tabs in an accordion, um, you're loading maybe an like a, an extra CSS and an extra JavaScript file. And now what's happening? You're loading those web fonts from our server, you know, which you uh, declared in the in the code. I'm showing you that um, in a little bit. So now you're uh, requesting the different variations, so different uh, WFF2 files, and then you're moving on to um, images that you need. And one of the image being, for example, as you can see here, the inner uh, inner one.jpg image, which is basically this background image here. Uh, so it's rather unimportant, yet it blocks one connection for like 3.3 seconds, um, and you know, and this is something you really want to avoid. So like, if you have something like that, especially something rather unimportant, it's very it's 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 very crucial to um, you know to to optimize it as much as possible. Um, and then you know you continue with the with the further images. So like, as you can see, the reason why. You know, you don't show the shoe image until the tenth second, is because you're kind of busy doing other stuff. You're kind of busy using, uh, you know, loading JavaScript. The JavaScript was put at the very bottom, so you know you're delaying the process even a little bit longer. And then you're, you know, loading resources like our fonts, you know, which are great, of course, <laughs> but you know, you you might not want to load them at at this moment. You know, you kind of like want to free up spaces, uh, space. To load the critical uh, resources. So right now, this is 44 requests. As I said, it's very abstract. You know, usually there would would be way more requests because you maybe have more products, you have some tracking pixels, um, etc. But just to give an idea, where do actually the problems come from? You know, although the, the site is very nice and you know it, it is already optimized, but there's still stuff that we can do. So now that we looked at this, let's talk about what we can actually do. And I'll swap over to this screen here. So we had this file initially. Um, and the first step you want to do is 
critical resources um, host on your own server unless you're very sure that you get a better performance out of the CDN. So definitely do like a quick A and B test and make sure that if you use a CDN, you're not actually delaying the process. So you know, you, usually it's used to, to help you. So make sure that it does. So this would be the first thing you do. You host the resources yourself. So, but that that's how how the site basically that I just showed you um, looks uh, basically looks like. So you're you know, you're starting the document, and then you have like multiple CSS files. So you're hosting uh, you're you're building your site on Bootstrap.css, which is very popular, and there's nothing wrong with Bootstrap. It's it's a it's a great framework. But what you also need to remember is that you know Bootstrap is built for a like a like a kind of like vast selection of sites. Like it should it should kind of it's kind of like this one one size fits all thing. So you potentially load a lot of CSS um, that you don't really need for your site. So keep that in mind when making decisions to use a framework rather than code your own. Um, and then you know you load more CSS like the flex slider, font awesome, the responsive tab CSS, some style CSS, and here I added a custom CSS to to make some overrides. Um, and then you go, you know, down the code, down the code. You know, that's you know, it's all familiar to you. Um, and then at the very bottom, what you do is let's go here. So that's when it starts. You're working with the JavaScript. So like suddenly here, you're starting, you know, to, to load jQuery, which you know you load at the very bottom. Yet you actually need it for 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 the above default content. So also keep that in mind. You're uh, loading the modernizer. You're loading Minicard. You're having image zoom. Um, what I, what I uh, briefly uh, explained as well, you know, do you really need image zoom on a mobile device? Probably not. Um, you know, you're loading the easy responsive tabs.js, which is its its own file, which all it does is, you know, it, it it toggles between the you know the accordion elements, and I will show you that you actually don't need um, uh, JavaScript for that. And then you know you uh, basically uh, define um, you know the the ID, like the diff with the ID that you want to um, use, um, use that function on. You get the flex slider, which is your uh, slideshow in uh, for for the shoes, and now you got stuff like move top JS, which is basically you know it allows you to do something like let's move over here, like something like this here, you know, click here and then it moves up. This is like it, it, it's rather a gimmick because you know. People are used to to scrolling on a mobile device, you know, and, and it flows quite nicely. So, you know, having such button is rather unnecessary, especially if you load an additional uh, JavaScript file for it. Um, you know, then you got some, uh, you got the the easing um, uh, jQuery plugin, so like smooth crawling, and um, and then you. Uh, Maybe have bootstrap.js down here. I actually tested it. It's not even necessary to display what we're displaying there. So as you can see, you're loading a lot of resources, a lot of CSS, a lot of JavaScript, and not all of that's necessary. Um, and now, basically, what we want to do is we want to optimize that. So I basically created, just copy pasted that HTML file, um, and then just called it index underscore optimized, and. Now I'll just quickly summarize what um, what we can do here, what, what what I've done, what you know could give you an idea, uh, you know what, what what's maybe possible on, on your own on your own uh, side or page. So uh, first is extract the critical CSS, and I thought about it quite a long time to see, you know, to kind of like I was thinking, okay, how should I actually uh, you know show those optimization techniques? Should I you know Go all in and basically create something that's almost impossible to replicate, um, or should I really work with what I have and say like, okay, you know, maybe I don't optimize it to, you know, like maybe down to two seconds or one second, but you know, I work with what I have and I don't, you know, delete too much stuff because, as you know, it's easier said than done to, you know, just delete parts of your CSS file or delete parts of your. Uh, of, of your JavaScript. So what I've done instead is like I really kept everything that's on there, like that 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 was in on the initial uh, page. I kept it. I just optimized it a little bit for speed um, because I think this gives you like just a better understanding of it. So again, extract critical CSS. What do I mean by that? Um, you know, I didn't go through Bootstrap CSS and now try to like extract the critical CSS um, because that might you know 
not be possible in your situation. Rather, what I did is think about what do I really not need in the above the full content? And that would be, for example, if I go here, just go up the code, it would be easy responsive tabs or font awesome. Because Found awesome, what, what do you load it for? Maybe to display one or two icons. Is that really necessary? I would say no. Easy responsive tabs. Do you really need this? Well, the, the responsive tabs are not shown until, you know, until like later, uh, uh, like below the fold. So you don't really need to load it at the very beginning. And then I just browse through the other files um, to see, OK, is there anything very obvious that I don't need to load? And then basically what I did is I created a critical CSS file, and I use the load CSS function. So how does it look? The critical CSS file, I basically you know, moved over all, all the stuff that I believe is critical to display the page uh, the way it was displayed before. And then I um, minimized it. Very important. Um, a lot of files we see are not minimized. And you can really save uh, you know, a few kilobytes on that. So you know, put it all on one line. This is not a critical CSS. And it's actually uh, it, it's based on bits and pieces of Bootstrap, Flex Slider, Style CSS, and my custom CSS. Put it all in one line. That is your critical CSS. That's all you load. Yeah. So if we go back in the waterfall here, we don't do this anymore. We don't want to load four different files anymore. Instead, we want to load one file. Now, I still want the rest of the CSS, and I don't want to delay the process further down the line. So now. All I did, again, that's what you should do. You copy paste the load CSS function, you put it inside the head part of your website of your page or website, and then you go down here, and here I defined CSS, so it because it's sitting in the CSS folder, non-critical. Okay? So this is basically holding all the CSS that I don't think is very critical at the very beginning. So that's in here. And again, I put it on one line because you want to minimize CSS. Uh, JS and HTML um, because there's no reason not to. So the result that will come from this, and I'll show you the waterfall in a bit. We first run through all the, the things we've done. Um, the result will be that we only load the one CSS file in the critical rendering path. CSS will be loaded asynchronously. Now, what is the next thing we need? Well, if we look at the page, we see that um, we have the slideshow here. So in this case, I didn't want to get rid of the slideshow. Um, and basically, not having a slideshow is definitely uh, much quicker because you know you're you're not relying um, you're not relying on uh, you, you, you know like basically not having a slideshow is like you know much quicker because you're not relying on JavaScript. Um, but you know, it would be just easier said than done. Because for example, if you have shoes, you really want to you know, show probably different angles. Um, so we kept it in there. And to optimize it, what we did is we just moved up the jQuery and the flex slider to put it at, the, you know, at, at, at a very early point so that we get it done with and that it's ready to actually load in uh, the, 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 the images uh, of the shoes. right? So that's what we did here. So we basically split up the, the JavaScript files that we had at the very bottom, moved two up. Um, and the, the others, we, we basically um, left where they were. So now we go all the way down. And what you will see is that I left the modernizer here and the mini card, because you will need it on that, uh, on that page. I deferred it, though, so that we don't um, load it early on. Um, and now I got rid of a few JavaScript files. Because if I just move, on, oh, just move quickly over here, I, for example, thought it was unnecessary to have the responsive tabs built with JavaScript. Um, and I also think that the move to top uh, JavaScript was, I, I don't think that's necessary in mobile. So we got rid, rid of that. Um, I also got rid of the, uh, the, the, the image zoom, because I think, on, again, on mobile, it's not really necessary to have that. So I reduced the number of JavaScripts that, that we needed. And I moved two up. I deferred to. Um, and now you might say, OK, but what actually happened with the, um, with the responsive tabs? So what we did is we just built it in CSS. So this is the other version. And you can see it here. This was the initial version. 
where like basically you have you know the responsive tabs built with JavaScript, and it looks nice. And now we build it with CSS. I think it also looks nice. It looks very similar. And you can obviously style it. It doesn't flow as nicely, but it, it does the job, right? So this is purely built with uh, CSS. So you can actually get rid of the JavaScript um, and therefore like, you know, get rid of resources you don't necessarily need. Now, the other thing that was happening or that happened in the initial page was this. So we had the font files. So you know, basically, we needed probably somewhere the Open Sans font 300, 300 italic, 400, 600. So that's you know a bit, bit exaggerated, but you know now the idea is that what we discussed earlier in length, we want that, but maybe we don't you know we don't need it straight away. So instead, what we did is we moved it all the way to the bottom. Just go here with this little function. Uh, basically, what it does is. It loads the Open Sans, um, the Open Sans font. Actually, here I, I loaded two. I don't know why I did that. Let's just do that quickly. Um, it loads the font, but not until we're done with the rest. So, like, it does it on the onload event, and the result is that it basically pushes down the font files until we're actually done with the more critical stuff. So, this is a very very qu uh, quick function, and you know, you only need to define a fallback font. You can just use Sans Serif, for example. Put this just before the HTML tag, and then you know you're basically prioritizing other more important, uh, more important files. Now, next, what do we need to do? The next thing we want to do is, for example, we want to optimize the images. Yeah. So like we saw, like in the initial test, that we load images for three seconds or 1.9 or 1.5 seconds, and we kind of like want to you know improve that as much as possible. So what you can do is. You can let me just move over and let move over here. You can just you know take all the images and go to Photoshop and see like is there anything I can actually improve? Like can I reduce the size? Do I maybe load sizes that are you know uh, too large for my screen? You can work with um, you know media queries to to load a specific image based on the screen size. You can uh, load with uh, you can work with source set. And then what you should always do is compress the images. So like in this case, I like to use image optim. It might not be your tool of choice, but basically, you know, you just take you know, all the images, throw them in here, and as you can see, you have savings of like 91%, 95%, 50%, 41%. So you you save on a lot of uh, you know, like on a lot of bytes and kilobytes, which will in the end really speed up your site. And now if we go back, so Going back to the top, so what have we done? So we extracted the critical CSS. We're loading the non-critical CSS asynchronously with uh, load CSS. We're loading the web fonts on the onload event. Um, bear in mind that on the previous slides, we showed you other ways of doing it, font face, ob uh, font face observer, for example. So up to you if you want to do it, how you want to do it. Um, we only loaded the necessary JavaScript. So we, for example, got, uh, got rid of the move uh, minus top.js, and we moved up the jQuery and the flex slider. We optimized the images for um, quicker load times, uh, just because you know on a 3G connection, we have reduced speed. So we, we want to get done with each picture as quick as possible. And then uh, last but not least, we minified the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript um, you know, just to save down in kilobytes as well. Now. The site functionality is not different. You can still, you know, move the slider. Uh, you still have your, you know, your little accordion here, and you can play around with the design. You still have the images. Like you have everything, you know, you had before. So it's not like that. It's a completely different site, but it has a big impact. So just to have a look again, previously we were at, you know, five seconds. So we had a render block for roughly five seconds. And we didn't show the image until 10 seconds, right? The speed index was 6,300. Now we optimized with a few things. So, like as you saw, like it was not a lot. It was it, it was by no means difficult. And now we basically brought it down to a speed index of 3,200, which is great because you know you basically cut it in half with the very basic things. And as you can see here, 
Now we're suddenly loading critical stuff after two and a half seconds rather than five. We're having the logo and the critical text after three seconds. And then we're having the shoes after five and a half. So we cut down the time it takes to, to display the shoe by five seconds, which is a lot. And you can see it here. Because we're only loading the critical CSS, we're loading the jQuery and the Flex that early on because we need it. We say, OK, we really need this to display. And then we're basically done after like just under two and a half seconds, and we got time to actually load the images. So this is really great. And as you can see, what happened here as well is that we're loading the non-critical CSS down here, um, and we're loading the custom, uh, the, the modernizer JavaScript and a mini card JavaScript just further down the line because we deferred it, right? If we go back here, it was up, like just further up the waterfall, right? So it was uh, you know, the 11th request, and now it's the 23rd request. What happens as well is that before, we had 44 network requests, and now we cut it down to 29. And I apologize that I got a 404 on the web, uh, on the font awesome font file. Um, I will fix that. <laughs> um, so you can see like, that we also cut, uh, cut down the uh, total amount of, um, of network connections, which is great when we're talking about crawl budgets and you know, like how much your, your server can handle and then how much the Google crawler will come by and, and all this stuff. So you can really see that it makes a huge, it makes a huge difference, and it is not very difficult. So I hope this was kind of like a good way to give you an idea of what you can do. Now, we, we had a look at, uh, at some of the comments. We will move over there right now. And I, I just briefly glanced at it, and I saw uh, optimizing for speed is not everything. And you're com completely right, and I think we mentioned that um, you know, many times. Optimizing for speed is not everything. Um, and we're, by no means we're saying that, and that's why we, you know, we, we, we're not saying you know, get you know, get rid of slideshows or get rid of this or that. It is really important you know, to have certain elements on your side uh, and, you know, to, and have high quality images on your side. But what we are trying to you know, give you an understanding of is you know, that with a few little, uh, you know, few little improvements, you can shave off five seconds you know, of, of showing a product image, and you're not losing out on usability. You're not losing out on design. It's, it's the same page is just as functional, but it's just slightly better optimized. Yeah, that's true. I think it's also important to keep in mind to have an idea of a performance budget. It's always like, what, I'm, what do I pay for this feature in terms of speed, and what might the extra seconds cost me in terms of online revenue? For example, like we touched upon this briefly before, A-B testing tags usually have to sit in the head, right? It's JavaScript. You have to have them there, and they will probably slow down your site. You can also optimize them, but still, exactly. they will slow down your site. But the gains you get from that, like the, the benefit you have from an A-B testing tech, if you really use it properly and use it a lot, I mean, the insights you gain is way more worth, we would say, probably, than it is to have like two extra seconds or one extra second of loading them, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's a really good point. Um, you know, it, it, it's really important to gather data and to understand your customers and to understand you know, what makes my customers convert. Um, you know, and, and if you find that um, you know, your customers convert better when it, your site takes two seconds longer to load, but you have maybe you know, uh, four high-quality images, that's great. You can A and B test around. Um, what we're saying is it's what we see globally, that speed is a very crucial um, a, a very crucial thing to users. Users are very impatient. So um, you know, every, everything we suggest is you know, take it with a pinch of salt um, and you know, think about it, how to implement it on your side. But I think the examples we just gave you are you know, very quick examples that you can do, have a high impact, and don't reduce the usability of your site. And I think that's the key, uh, the key message we want to get across. Um, Maybe one question before we jump into the viewers question yeah. from my side would be, so let's say our customers have to prioritize because they can't optimize every product side and every landing page because, well, as we saw before, Christmas business or holiday business is starting soon. Yeah. How would, they, how would you recommend to prioritize sites? Yes. Uh, 
I would probably try to, you know, really find the low hanging fruits. So like, you know, don't rely on one score. Like, you know, check your your website with, um, you know, PageSuite Insight, the new test my site with um, um, web page test, and just see, like, what is really the the main problem. It can be as easy as not having, uh, you know, GSIP enabled. Mm -hmm. That could be one thing um, if you spot that. That's a very e easy thing to fix. It could be that you haven't optimized your, your images, and the image or one or two images sit in the critical rendering path. So optimizing uh, both images might have a good impact already. Um, other than that, you know, a focus on render blocking resources is obviously always a good idea, um, CSS and JavaScript. Um, I do understand it's not always easy. Mm -hmm. um, it depends how long, or like how many people have worked on the file, and you know how well optimized or comment, uh, you know how, how how many comments you have, so like you know exactly what part is you know doing what on my side. So obviously this is really important to optimize the render blocking um, resources. Uh, that that will depend a little bit on like how much resources do you have to allocate to optimizing your site. Um, I would say another quick win might be the web fonts because I feel like. You know that's a very easy thing to, to actually fix. It has a great impact. I mean, as you saw, not having text for three seconds is not great. By just using a fallback font at first, and you you actually show text after like immediately. I think that's that's a great uh, improvement of the of the usability. Cool. Okay, let's quickly check if we can jump into one or two of you viewers questions. Okay, so could you explain the German labels? Um, ooh, I don't actually know where the German labels were. Um, let's go to the next question. I have a look um, and see if I can spot what was actually meant by that. Or maybe if you're oh, still in was chat. The, it was probably the time before Christmas, yeah. So ah. it was the. Um, well, the timeline under the very first graph. So sorry for that. There was a German um, study. Ah, OK. Um, so there we had some German. It's basically the time before Christmas here. Yeah, it's one week before Christmas, two and three days before Christmas. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> a little um, bias here. Um, well, other than that, it looks like we don't have too many questions for now. Um, well, I think that's good. Maybe we touched upon everything. If not, as we said before, please keep in mind that we have a lot of um, videos already in our repository. So I'd highly recommend going there, have a look. There's like a whole video on fonts. There's a whole video on slideshows, how you can improve them, which I think is very critical. Um, a video on the purchase funnel and the checkout funnel, which might be very interesting, especially for retail. Um, and yeah, lots of other stuff. So if you have more questions, I'd say go there um, or comment in the comments below. Definitely. And um, I would say, yeah, comment, uh, write a comment, or else we'll see you probably, not probably, we'll definitely see you next month. So if you have anything uh, that you know in mind, uh, just take it to the next session, pop it in the, in the live chat, and we'll try to address it. Um, and yeah, I would say thanks for listening. Um, Thanks, Dennis, for your first session. And I'm looking forward to more. And um, yeah, I hope it was interesting. Um, I hope the examples were somewhat practical. Um, as I said, or as we both said, it's, it's a rather abstract example. So you know, it might not be applicable on all of your sites. But we hope that you, you got the idea of what we're trying to do. Um, and I think the key message to take away is that um, you know. Improving performance is not always as tricky and complicated and time consuming as it uh, looks at first glance. That's true. Cool. With that, um, have a good day and um, let us know what you thought. We're thinking. Um, send us some feedback and bye bye. Bye, guys.